like to do is call someone up here that you should all know very well at this point. You might not recognize him anymore. He has some new uh, additions on his face, but uh, to give us a company update real quick, I'd like to introduce the CEO of Hobart Financial Group and my dear friend here, Chris Hobart. I guess I'll address the, uh, I guess the white elephant in the room. Uh, I know many of you said, boy, Chris used to be so clean cut and now Chris isn't clean cut anymore. It's not that. I went on vacation earlier this month and it was a family vacation. And guys, how many of you just don't shave when you go on vacation? I can't be the, okay, perfect. I refuse to shave if I'm on vacation because I do it every day for my life. And this time I said, yeah, I'm not shaving. And I got home from vacation and my kiddos looked at me and they said, dad, keep it going. And I thought it's August surely I'll shave it in another week or two. And then I was getting ready to shave it and my, my oldest daughter Sloan said, Dad, please, please don't shave it. So here we are a month in, not too bad a growth, but that's why you're seeing Chris with facial hair, but it's not gonna be here forever. So, uh, so admire it uh, while you can or detest it while you can, whatever your view of beards are. Um, <clears throat> as I was preparing for our talk today, I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to kind of share with you a little bit of an origin story uh, as, we, as we dig into what I'm going to call a state of the company address and then dig into the uh, economic piece. But I was thinking back to February of 2004. And I remember sitting in my office in February 2004 and I was, quite frankly, I was, I was worn out, I was tired, and I was, I was irate. And if, uh, if you know the story, you're going to find out why I was so irate. See, it happened about a month prior. And I had a client walk into my office and uh, her name was Wilma. I know it sounds like a made-up name, but her name was Wilma, and she was one of my favorite clients at the time. And at this time, I didn't have Hobart Financial Group. I worked for a big brokerage firm. And when Wilma came into the office, she was a little bit sheepish, and she said, Chris, I was talking to my neighbor, and my neighbor is telling me about some investing concepts that they're using that I think would be perfect for me. And I said, well, Wilma, tell me about it. We hear this a lot. People hear from different folks. But Wilma told me about the scenario of what she was trying to accomplish, and I sat there and I said, oh my goodness, this is absolutely perfect for what she's told me her goals are and everything. And I said, this is great. The problem is, I then had to tell Wilma, hey, I work for this big company and they don't do it. And they refuse to do things like this. But Wilma said, Chris, I really want to work with you and I want you to do this for me. So I've made our promise. And I said, I'm going to go up as high as I can and go through all the phone trees and go to the home office and talk to everybody that I can to see if we can get this approved for Wilma in her situation. And I did it. In fact, I got to the number two in command at this gigantic firm. And I got to talk to the guy named Mr. Shaughnessy. And I said, Mr. Shaughnessy, I've got a client named Wilma and her situation's pretty unique and specific. She needs this, 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 and this, and this is the way that it can be accomplished, but we can't do that. And he looked at it and looked at it and he said, you know, Chris, you're right, that does fit her situation just about perfect. But we can't do that type of investing here because, well, quite frankly, there's not enough money in it for us. And it competes with our most profitable area of, of, of an investment product, that's our big profit margin. And he said, I've got an idea, Chris. Instead of us granting this one exception, how about you talk to Wilma about how good these things are right here and make sure that that's where she puts her money. Well, as I got back to the office after that conversation, I came to a quick realization that that's not how this should be done. In fact, when I really thought about it, it was why I was so frustrated and so angered and what I ended up doing is within two weeks, I left that company and I started Hobart Financial Group. So that's actually why so many of you are here is because a bad situation. Now, one thing I will tell you, when I started the company, I didn't have a vision of this. In fact, Renee, my wife, who was just up here that was doing the raffle for all of us, she'll tell you, uh, our initial vision of the company, Hobart Financial Group, was to keep it small. Keep it very, uh, you know, where it was just the two of us, no employees. You guys all understand employees are headaches. Oh, hey, <laughs> hey, Corey, Andrew, Mike, uh, Jacob, uh, uh, Eli, can you guys cover your ears real quick for me? You guys know that, and, no, I'm just kidding, guys. But we wanted to keep it small. In fact, a funny story is I used to actually just go to people's house to meet with them, and I had a printer and a copier and a scanner in the back trunk of my car, and when I met with people, if I needed to make a copy of a driver's license, I would say, just a second, I'll be right back. I'd go out to my car, make a copy of the license, and we'd go from there. 
Now, I share this with you because I think it's important to understand the origin of where uh, Hobart, Financial, Hobart Financial Group came from. But I also think it's important because the one thing and the one reason why I left where I was and formed this company hasn't changed. And the reason that you're here today and why we enjoy working with you guys so much is, is because when it comes to your wealth, we realize that this is incredibly personal for all of you. And when it comes to your wealth, it's not always just about money. In fact, when I think of everybody that I see in here that I know your stories, I know it's about family and I know it's about security. And for some of you, uh, just telling me about travel, and I know it's about making sure that you can give back when possible. And for a lot of you, it's just your wealth is about not having to worry about it at all. Now, at Hobart Financial Group, what has been and what always will be is we take your wealth personally, and that's important for us. You know, you've entrusted your income, your nest egg to us, and we appreciate that, but we realize it's more than a nest egg, it's your goals and it's your dreams. And this is a big responsibility that we don't take lightly, which is why we commit to you every day. And while you're here and when you're not here and we're at the office, we commit every day to be walking side by side with you step by step. Now, real quick, this year has been a big year of growth at Hobart Financial Group, but also a big year of change. And I know a lot of our clients have seen some changes. Some people have asked me about it. And I want to talk a little bit about that. See, our commitment to all of you is to continuously improve what we're doing to make sure that we're offering the best we can. So in the past year, we've made some tremendous uh, transitions, but it was to really honor our commitment to you that we needed to really sharpen what we were doing and make sure that our service offering to you was as great as possible. So on behalf of the team that's back here and the team that's still at the office today, I just want to thank you guys. Because the reason we went through this transition and we've been able to do what we've been able to do was really based upon feedback from all of you. And this company was built for all of you. So the more you can give us feedback and the more ideas you can bring to us, just like Wilma brought me an idea that little did she know, and Wilma's passed away since, uh, since then, but little did Wilma know when she brought me that idea that it would lead to all of us having a, having a conversation like this today. So real quick, based upon the input and recommendations that you gave me, there's three things that we're going to be focusing on for all of you in the upcoming years. Number one, we want to focus on communication. Now, the thing is there's a lot going on in the world around communication, and it can be almost overwhelming. So what we want to do is we want to focus on communication to make everything as impactful as possible. And while technology can help us do that, we don't want technology to replace our connection with you. Uh, now, as we talk about this, there is a piece of technology that we are going to be introducing to all of you in the next several months that some of you have been working with. But I wanted to make you aware of it because it's going to help us communicate with you better. It's a platform called eMoney. Now, eMoney is a financial planning tool that we use that you're going to be able to log into, but it's going to be the, way, the area that we aggregate all of your accounts together, and it's going to be that we communicate clearly to you about the financial planning that's going on behind the scenes, and it's going to act as your source for everything financial. The uh, second thing that we're going to focus on is client education. And I realize that's why you're here today. And we're going to get into the meat and potatoes of the client education. But when we talk about client education, we want to have impact, impactful financial information for you, retirement planning information on a consistent basis. So in the next several months, you're going to start hearing more and more about all of this. In fact, we're going to start increasing our areas that you can learn from. Specifically, we're going to increase our video library on educational topics. So when you're at home, you're bored, you're eating that ice cream, lucky you. You can look at me talk about financial stuff on your computer. I know you're excited. Calm down, calm down. Also, we're going to be increasing the amount of classes that we do specifically around financial issues. So some of you have come to the coffee club that we hold at the office, really kind of intimate for about eight to 10 people. We're going to continue those once a month every uh, Friday, second uh, Friday of every month. We're going to continue our taxes in retirement classes. And of course, we're going to continue to do things like this where we talk about the economy, investments, and all that comes with that. But going forward, the goal for us as we communicate to you and educate you is less sizzle and more substance. We want to have a lot more that's going to be impactful for you. And the things that we're going to be sending to you and communicating with you are meant to have the greatest impact possible. And finally, the third thing that we want to focus on, and I think it's the most important one, is focusing on all of you and how we can deliver a better experience to all of you on a more consistent basis. Uh, we want our relationship with you to be more about the financial stuff. And we want our, our partnership 
really to be more about investments and rate of re or less about investments and rate of return. Uh, but we want to make sure that we're focusing on the most important piece, which is our connection. You know, in the past 5, 10, 15 years, the financial world's done a lot with technology. There's a lot going on. Kezia is going to talk about that in a little bit. But technology has really begun to boom in the financial world. And it's great for financial folks to do better for all of you. But the one thing we found that automation and technology just can't do, it can't replace the most important thing, which is the human connection. And the ability to understand situations and the ability to care and the ability to look at you eyeball to eyeball and have a tough conversation or have a celebration when your kid or when your grandchildren hits a home run or if you lose somebody, we can have those types of conversations. And that's going to be our focus in this year to come, which is how do we have more important, impactful conversations with each and every one of you. You know, when I look at my staff out here, this is why we come to work every day. It's what inspires us. It's because we know we've got a great group of clientele just like you guys that have some phenomenal retirement dreams and goals that you're working through right now, and we're excited for all of you. And I just want to thank you again for your partnership. I want to thank you for all that you've, uh, you've meant to Hobart Financial Group. But most importantly, I want to thank you that you've given us feedback through the years that has made us better. And in turn, our goal is to simply make it a better experience for all of you. So with that, let's get this show started. Mr. Greer, will you come on up and introduce uh, Kezia to the, uh, to the crowd? And you guys know this. Kezia, you're going to find is really, 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 really sharp. And I was peppering her with some tough questions during lunch today. I'm going to encourage you when we have our question and answer session, do the same. I want you guys to, uh, to try this out because she is, uh, she's, uh, I dare say, just about brilliant. I know I'm setting you up, but I'll let Andrew actually do the introduction. Thanks, Andrew. I know. Look at me. Thanks. Well, th thank you, Chris. And, and to that point, before I do introduce Kezia. Yeah. There you go. That was for the beard, right? Uh, before I do introduce Kezia, one, one uh, thing to say about the Q&A. If we can all agree with one thing um, during that session, let's try to stay away from the political side of things. I think that we can all agree at this point in time, it's pretty easy to get sucked down that rabbit hole. So if we can all agree to, to stay away from that, uh, I think it would be a very successful Q&A session. So, um, so now let's get the show on the road. Again, our guest speaker today is Kezia Samuel. Uh, Kezia is the Chief Portfolio Strategist at Global Financial Private Capital. Uh, before joining Global, she held similar positions at both Jackson National and JP Morgan. Uh, she is a, gr a graduate of Fordham University, for all you New Yorkers out there. Um, she is the first female to join the equity and derivatives trading desk at JP Morgan, so a huge honor there. And last but not least, a little fun fact for Kezia, she is one of 51 cousins. So there you go. So Kezia, come on up. Thank you very much. That is true. I was sharing with Andrew earlier a little factoid. You know, the population in India, sort of large. Well, I say this, that my family had certainly some contribution to that number. Well, good afternoon, all of you. My name is Kezia Samuel. I'm going to start with a quick question. A little icebreaker. How many of you have met a Kezia before? You know, I travel the country, and I ask this question, and I've yet to see a hand go up. So a little, little story about how I came about my name, right? And the reason I'm going to share this is this is our session to talk about the facts, turn down that noise that's coming out our way constantly, and evaluate how the facts impact the long-term economy. Is that fair? So we're going to shut the doors down and truly talk about what's happening fact by fact and what it all means to each and every one of us and our bottom lines. So how did I come about this name, Kezia? It's born and raised in India. It's not a very Indian name. My mom uh, wanted a girl, so I had two older brothers, seven and nine years older than me. And she was pregnant, and she said, I really want a girl. So she goes to church and says, I want a girl. And the nun says, well, if you let me name her, you'll have a girl. <laughs> Lo and behold, she believed. Well, nine months later, I was born. And she takes me from the hospital to the nun, 
little factoid here. If back in the days in India, I'm going to date myself now, you did not need paperwork in order to take a baby out of the hospital, but neither here nor there. She takes me and she says, what, what should we name her? And the nun says, let's name her Kasia. And this is my mother's reaction. What? <laughs> what is that? Well, it is from the Bible. It's Job's third daughter. In the Hebrew origin of the name, it's Keziah, K-E-Z-I-A-H, right? So she tells me the story. I've known this all my life. But then I got curious, because it is an unusual name nonetheless. How many of you have typed your name into Google? Ever type your name into Google? What does it mean? So I typed my name into Google. And it came up as, it means bark of cinnamon. <laughs> Wait, that's not the punchline. It happens to be the only thing I'm allergic to in life. <laughs> so what are the chances that I was named this in a very unique name, and years down the road, I look it up and I find out that it means bark of cinnamon, again, the only thing that I'm allergic to. So I share this little tidbit about myself as a way to warm this moment up. Again, as I'm going through something that's going to be fairly serious in nature, ask questions. I've got a few ground rules about how we talk about the economy. One, I've been doing this now for the 19th year. I look at a screen that's flashing red and green at me with numbers all day long. And sometimes I forget that perhaps what I've spoken is Spinglish, financial English, an acronym that perhaps may not make sense to you. So if I do do that, would you keep me honest? Is that fair? And the second one being, if you have a burning question, I know we're going to do a Q&A at the end, you don't have to hold that burning question. We can make this as engaging as you'd like this to be. So with that, shall we get started? Excellent. So we're going to talk about many of the slides in here. This is the continuity from what we have seen at the start of the year. Right? At the start of the year, we look out at the global economies and look not just for what's happening in stock markets per year, but what are some of the bigger drivers of global growth that's going to be key to markets continuing to post positive returns? So I'm going to start with the very first slide, which is what stock market returns are predicted to be by Wall Street strategists. So we took a bunch of 17 people, some of the smartest and the brightest in the room, and asked them to predict where they think stock market returns are going to be at the start of each year, right? And that's that blue line. And the turquoise is the where it actually ends up to be. Is there a pattern that you see? The answer is no, there is no pattern. And the point of this chart is primarily to show that trying to predict calendar year stock market returns is a fallacy. It's a worthless exercise in some ways to do, not in the sense that we want to know what's happening each area in each year, but rather trying to pinpoint, I would like to have 8% return, is nearly impossible to do. Right? If we could predict it with that level of certainty, wouldn't we all be on an island that we owned of our own? Is that fair? So while we look at this, and in fact, when we did the mid-year review of where they are in 2018, using the S&P 500 as a gauge, the average range from a low of 2750, which is where the index on the low end, and 3000 on the high end. Where are we today? Somewhere at 2870. Somewhere right in the middle. So maybe they'll finally have a shot where the green and the blue bars line up. Stock markets on an annual basis, on a monthly basis, are nearly impossible to predict. But instead, what we look for are drivers of growth. And what do I mean by that? We're going to look, again, themes that we started out in the year that we want to see where we stand today. There are five key themes that we're going to focus in on. The first is, where are we in the economy? I'll take a quick poll here, make sure everyone's still awake and alert. How many of you feel the economy is in good, healthy standing? 
fabulous. We'll talk about why there is, why that is the case, what are some of the risks, but we'll talk about what that is in the first instance. And the second we're going to look at is as it relates to, you know, when we talk about changes, what the Fed is doing is really important. Why is that important? What does it mean to all of us? And they're the only ones that can upset the apple cart, so to speak. The third we're going to talk about is something that perhaps has been emerging, has been talked about, but just doesn't get the airtime of how else can the U.S. diversify how we grow, right? How do we grow today, and what are the businesses can we get invested in to diversify how we grow as an economy? We'll talk about the oil industry there briefly. We'll talk about how all of this means in terms of investing for each and every one of us. Nine years into the bull market, is it different than the start of the bull market? Yeah, so how should an investor think of investing during this cycle? And then we'll wrap this up with one of the most exciting things for me, which is what drives long-term stock market growth, which is product innovation and entrepreneurship. Where do we stand there? What are some of the statistics? And is it continuing or is it lost? So those are the five key themes. I'm going to spend the most of the time on the first one and then ride my way through the others. So let's get started on the very first one. We call this the exiting the school zone because remember 2008? Everyone remember 2008? Like it was yesterday, even though it was nearly 10 years ago now? I'm going to remind ourselves of that because it's very important the fact that all of you nodded vehemently yes because it has an impact on what happens in markets. So let's come back to that quickly though. Well, when we exit what we define as a school zone, sometimes I leave work and I have to drive through a school zone. Anyone go from 40 to 20? You look in the rear view hoping that no one's hit you in the back? Well, how many of you felt that since 2008, we just have been sluggish in our growth? Sluggish, yeah? Two, two and a half percent doesn't seem very impressive, so let's talk about very briefly how we got here. Everyone remember the great credit crisis of what happened as it relates to excess in buying mortgages or whatever those may be and it trickling down to essentially not just the United States but elsewhere in the globe. But how do we get out of it? Anyone remember how we got out of it? Stimulus. stimulus. I'm glad you mentioned that. So what do, you, what do I mean by stimulus? Right? What we had to do was the federal government had to step in and bail us out. The U.S. economy, the size of the U.S. economy is $19.5 trillion. Right? Write that down. Try to keep that number in mind because people sometimes don't remember that. $19.5 trillion. 2.5% of $19.5 trillion. Anyone know what that number is? Very big number, right? So when you have a big behemoth, the reason I mention these numbers, when you have a big behemoth like this, and you slow it down, think of a big truck driving down the highway really fast. When it crashes, how long does it take to get it started again? A long time. As a result of that great credit crisis, the Federal Reserve had to step in and spend a tremendous amount of money to get us going. And that was approximately four and a half trillion dollars. Someone do the rough math here. Four and a half trillion out of 19 and a half, roughly. Right, 2025, big number? Big number. So as a result, we're going to be conscious of, okay, so we had to do that. But is that sustainable if the government just keeps piling on money? That's one side of the equation, right? So while we have seen us coming out of the credit crisis, it's taken us a long time. The two points I want to relay from here is that while we've seen a resurgence of growth from 2008, it feels slow and steady. That's how we want it to be. Because it's easier to control the steady, methodical growth than it is to something that grows far too quickly. Again, think of that big trailer truck. You get it started, how long does it take to get it stopped again? 
it's going to crash into something. So that's one point. The other point is that we are the largest economy in the globe. There is no one in comparison to the United States. And we have taken charge of the growth in the global spectrum by a significant mile. So we have won this battle for a long standing relative to all of our peers. So it feels slow. What we're going to look at is I'm a chemist by training. You're going, huh, money manager and chemist, that makes a ton of sense, right? But formulas are inherent to both sides of the profession. When I look at when we see the, what are the starting fundamentals? We talked about what happened. Well, we all agreed, I saw you going, well, that's not sustainable. If the government just keeps spending, that is not a sustainable formula. So what's the fundamentals today? How far are we to a recession? How many of you would like to know that? We'll talk about that. And we'll talk about the turbo boost that we've seen in the recent years as to why we think that can continue to sustain the growth that we have, which takes us out of the school zone that we have felt. And we've already seen some of the data come through in the first half of this year. But let's start with what the fundamentals are. I talked about on the left-hand side the first part of this race, which was we came into the 2008 crisis. We had to have the Federal Reserve step in. Look at that chart on the left-hand side. You see how it goes from a trillion all the way up to four and a half trillion or so? That is our balance sheet that got bigger by what? The government buying a variety of different investments. Why do they do that, just briefly? They do this, what happens when you have a big buyer that comes in and says, I will buy everything that I see? What happens to prices? Starts to go up. What happens to all of our 401ks and retirements? Look, starts to look nicer, right? It builds confidence into the economy. That is what the left-hand side, or part one of the equation was. But we recognize that's part one of the equation. We need part two, which is what needs to happen. We need businesses to step in, in order to pick up the slack from the public sector. So what are our businesses spending? Businesses are spending. Here's a number that we look for. We look for how much capital expenditures. What do I mean by this? When a factory gets old, you gotta replace the factory and factory parts. When technology gets outdated, you gotta replace it. All of that spending creates boon in the economic environment. Any idea what companies are spending? Companies have spent, this is the S&P 500, $167 billion in the first three months of this year. It is one of the highest numbers that we have seen in seven years. Why do you think they're doing that? Bingo, right? Tax breaks. And I'll come back to a bigger version of that story, but this has a dramatic impact Taking the corporate tax rate from the 30s down into the 20s has truly created a competitive environment in the United States, creates confidence in the businesses to be able to create jobs and begin spending that money back into the economy. Seven year record. So that's what we're starting to see. So we're seeing the businesses begin the spending. So that's part one of the equation. Well, what about how much runway do we have? For that, we look to not just the big businesses in the S&P 500 index that I quoted. These are the 500 of the biggest companies. But we all know an example of Hobart Financial, a smaller company. That is the fabric of the United States. That is where growth and jobs are created on a larger scale, more so than just the big companies. Those are what grab the headline, but truly, when we look at small businesses, who can read the, the three statistics on the screen? And that's why I asked. All right, well, I'm gonna repeat the first one, and tell me if you're surprised by this. In 2014, firms with less than 500 workers made up 99.7% of the 
of all businesses in the United States. How many of you are surprised by that? Right? It is not a fact that gets discussed. However, the mom and pop businesses within our economies are truly what drives growth. Look at the businesses around you. Drive out from your house and see all the different businesses. Are they the big names? Some are, but the majority of them are smaller businesses. Let's continue on to the second one. Firms with less than 20 employees makes up nearly 90% of all businesses. Surprised? Yes. Why doesn't this get covered on the news? Because some of it is just not as sexy, right? Not as big, hard to look at. And the last thing we are going to look at is Look at the number of jobs that have been created. 60% of the jobs that have come post the crisis came from small businesses. Impressive? Very impressive. Let's add to this. So we look at something called the Small Business Optimism Index. What all this does is it takes a survey of the small businesses and ask them, how do you feel about the economy? Do you feel confident about hiring new jobs? Do you feel confident about making investments into growing it into other businesses? It is at a 45-year high. The last time we saw these numbers were back in 1983. How many of you are surprised by that? 1983. Okay. 23% of them, one or two, are looking to create jobs. About a third of them, 30% or so, are looking to hire people but can't find them. How many of you are impressed by that statistic? It's hard, right? So right now the labor market is booming, but again, something that does not get covered, that chart on the left-hand side that looks at small business optimism has gone ticked higher than where we were at the start of the year. That's what we're looking for because that's, again, the fabric of what creates jobs and continued growth. So how far are we to a recession? Yeah? This is a little complicated chart. So walk with me as I look through what we see on this chart. What we see here on this chart are two lines, one that measures the U.S. economic growth as measured by what we call as GDP. So think of it like a scorecard, right? You get a report card. The U.S. economy gets a report card based on all the economic activity, what we manufacture, what we import, net, net, what's that number, okay? So the number you hear about 2.5%, that's that economic report card, so to speak. Here, we're going to look at that in the blue line, the dark blue line. That's the economic scorecard, so to speak. The other is what the federal funds, or the Fed funds, Federal Reserve is doing with interest rates. Do you see a pattern happening? We looked at the last two recessions, right? And we just, we picked it here because the chart couldn't expand any further. But you run this to World War II, the same pattern emerges. Same exact pattern. What's the pattern? What's happening to the two lines? What happens to the green line? It starts to go up. Then what happens to the blue line? It crosses over at some point and starts to fall. Think of it this way. I'm, I know, the contrast is not the best, is it? Yeah. The contrast is not very good at all. I'm sort of squinting my way. My apologies for that. So what we see on the line is when the federal funds, let's walk through the idea or the concept of this though, right? When do you feel more confident about buying a new house or buying a new car? When interest rates are at 2% or at interest rates are at 8%? 2% you say, of course. Okay, well, what happens when the Federal Reserve starts to raise interest rates? All of us, that are drivers of the U.S. economy. I want you to all congratulate yourselves because all of us makes up how the U.S. economy grows. 70% of how the U.S. economy grows is all of us spending money. So as my husband says, buy on sale, sweetheart. Right? So we need to spend money in order to keep this engine going. 
When the Federal Reserve starts to raise rates, we start to pull back how much we spend, start to become bigger savers. That slows the economic engine. That takes the blue line sending downward. So there's a fine line between where interest rates should be and how much economy should grow. So you may say, how many of you are thinking in there? So why don't they just keep it at zero? Who's thinking that? Keep it at zero. Well, what's the problem? What's the thing? Who was here in the 80s and got a mortgage at something called 18%? Yeah? Remember those days? Yeah, I see a lot of heads nodding. Yes, that's what's happened. What's the word that goes behind that? What's the word that we really haven't seen? Inflation. Fascinating. OK, so what is this inflation thing? If you let your economy overheat, all of a sudden, you're going to have to pay a lot more higher prices. What happens when inflation gets out of control? Everyone stops buying. The same effect that you're trying to avoid. So as a result, the Federal Reserve has to play this very sensitive game. It's very, very tricky. You don't want to keep it at zero to let the economy just overheat its way. Anyone know Venezuela? Right? What's happening there? Hyperinflation. We don't want that. Right? This is when they took the currency and didn't do anything to it. So as a result, the Federal Reserve has to play this very sensitive game, walk this fine line between not letting the economy overheat. Why? Because at some point, if there is any type of geopolitical issue, we don't know. We can't predict those things. That's such as life. What tools does the Federal Reserve have left if they left interest rates at zero? Take it down to negative? That's what Europe did, and look at where they are. Right? So there's this fine balance of we can't keep it at zero for too long because the economy is going to get hot. You want to move it along just ever so slightly to try and have this right balance between how the economy is growing and how much you feel like spending. As long as the economy can sustain its growth, which we have seen, and I'll talk more about that, this balance can continue. That gap you see, how many of you are looking at that, for those that can see it, are looking at that and going, isn't it like in next month? Isn't it going to cross over? That's a fairly wide gap as far as when we in the economist world look at these things. There's some room to run, especially if the second part of this equation works out. And what, do I, what am I talking about here? When we did a survey, again, of businesses to see what is bothering you, right? What are some of the bigger issues that bother you? Who's surprised by the top two things? Hopefully, everyone can see the very first one. What's the first one? Taxes. What's the second one? Regulations. What are two things that have changed as part of the recent administration, right? Again, I'm thinking about the impact of this to smaller businesses. Put our personal feelings aside. I'm simply going to look at how does this relate to economic indicators and businesses. So taxes are significantly, again, a disadvantage to where we were in comparison to our peers in the industry around the globe. Let's bring this to home. How many of you have heard of this story called repatriation of money? Saw a few hands go up. So let's talk about it a little bit more. What happens when I'm a big company like Apple? Anyone hear of Apple? Right? Everyone's got something from Apple in their pockets or bags. Apple was asked this very interesting question back in 2015. Tim Cook was being interviewed, and they said, Mr. Cook, we know you have money parked away in Ireland. Why do they do that? They don't want to pay taxes on the gains that they've made abroad. Yeah? And they said, why don't you bring that money and essentially reinvest it into the US economy? Great American company. He said, no way. Okay. Recently, though, Tim Cook made the decision in late 2017 to make a one-time tax bill of anyone know how much? $39 billion. One-time tax bill. Pretty big number. but. Always relative, though, right, in context. So if he had made that decision in 2015 to make the same bill, anyone know what it would have been? 
$95 billion. As the CEO, what business decision would you make? Pay 39 or pay 95? That's a fairly simple equation, isn't it? Right? That's how you can think of the impact of the corporate tax cuts and how it brings back some of the monies back into the United States. Another example, anyone here of Boeing? Boeing, yeah, big company. I fly quite a bit, so I'm probably sitting on one of their flying objects. They are spending $300 million in something that's slightly different. They're reinvesting in improving the labor and skill of its employee base, trying to give them higher paying jobs on the skill level. That is very important because remember the number that I said earlier, there are jobs to be had, but perhaps it's not the job you want because there's a skill gap between what people want to the level of comfort they are desiring and seeking. So that's something that this tax break has dramatically shifted in this space. So when we look at the equation, let's bring it all back together. When we look at the fundamentals, we started with the government spending a ton of money. We passed the baton, so to speak, to businesses to take on that spending and continue the growth in the economy. We've got some runway specifically as it relates to the smaller businesses and how they feel about the economy to continue to add jobs. We're looking at the turbo boost, which truly is a turbo boost as it relates to the corporate tax cuts that we have seen. And we feel that that is going to help us continue the expansion that we have come to enjoy for the last nine years. The latest economic growth number that we saw, the US got a scorecard of 4.2%. That's how fast we grew. The quarter prior to that, it was 2.2%. We do think that's a little higher than normal, but it gives you an indication of what happens when you spend that money into the economy. So first point there. Let's continue on to this story. The Fed, the Fed is very, very important. I think this is the one unknown that can put us into a recession. And we saw that chart earlier, remember? The two lines crossing over. And so it's very important what the Fed is doing. The Fed has had a change, right? How many of you know this guy? Jerome Powell. Jerome Powell is slightly different than all the other Fed chairs that we've had. Typically, a Fed chair that gets nominated is very academic in nature, has spent years behind the desk with books stacked up yay high, and is not someone who's been in the private sector. It's just not the case. Jerome Powell brings the blend of the two together, has been at the Treasury, but also has been working alongside Warren Buffett. And we think that blend of the two is a combination that is better situated for addressing how interest rates should be raised going forward. So something we watch very closely. But here's the other part. Remember what I said earlier? How large is the US economy, for those that are still awake? $19.5 trillion? How much did we spend to get us out of this mess? Four and a half. I'm impressed. <laughs> Nearly 20%. Can we do it again? I hope not, <laughs> is the answer. Right? I think that will be a fairly big burden on our economy and our deficit in the long run. And so that's something we think that the Fed this time has taken an extensive stretch. This is bigger than any other movement that they've seen as it relates to how much money they have spent. And they're going to be very, very careful and steady to not upset the apple cart, so to speak. But we're watching this space very, very closely. We're at 2% or so today, right? Far from the long term. Anyone know what the long term average is? We've been at zero for so long that it just feels like I should just get zero. Right? Who, who's gotten more than $5 in their checking account in the last three years? <laughs> Nobody. But the long-term average is somewhere in that four. Right? We are far, far from being on the top. So when people hear about raising interest rates and causing havoc, 
Markets are going to react because for the longest time, they've had free money. So if you're going to raise my interest rates, it's going to cost me a little extra. They'll make a little noise, but it is far from game over. So don't equate the two together. Let's continue on to the energy renaissance. How many of you have heard of the fact that the US is energy independent? How many of you know that the United States is the largest producer of oil today? Here's the underlying message I want us to all walk away with. Remember when I said earlier how the US economy grows? And my answer was, my husband says, buy on sale. We have been growing our economy by buying the goods from all of the other countries around the globe. Right? We are consumers, and we are the largest consumer. Is that the only way we want to grow? No. We want to have diversification, just as we talk about diversification in how you build your long-term retirement goals. We want to have diversification in how our economy can grow in the future as well. The ability to have energy renaissance allows us to diversify our portfolio. Doesn't mean we have to, but it gives us that ability. Here's some interesting statistic, and this is one of my favorite charts. This chart compares how the United States produce oil, and if we were to look forward, right, how much we produce today and look forward, and compared us in that same time frame to what Saudi Arabia did in its best payday period. What happens to the two lines? They kind of go together, and then the US ends up on the top, which we have. Here we are halfway through the year, and we're already on the top. But this should tell you something meaningful. Let's do a little story time here. Saudi Arabia recently, how many of you seen, it's been in the news, the new prince wants to do, has opened up a movie theater. It's big deal there. They've never had a movie theater. They're letting women drive, right? We're allowed to go to soccer games. I mean, sounds petty in some instances, but this is huge by a milestone. Well, why the change of heart, folks? All of a sudden want to make some movies in Hollywood, let some freedom out. Why do you think that is? Diversify. Diversify. Who's going uh, to Saudi Arabia uh, to take a tour in the next two years? <laughs> is it a common destination? What are they known for? One trick pony. Yeah? So when you hear about the United States as being potentially a significant competitor, to your core business, what are you going to start to do? You're going to start to diversify. This is precisely, so bringing back that story to this is why as the US, when we look at the ability to do other things to broaden how our economy grows, it is exciting to us because we start to push back on some of the competitors out there in that space. Cost of drilling has changed significantly. We went from drilling the old fashioned way we're now exporting, right? We can now export, and Asia is starting to import from the United States because we can produce it cheaper, and the way we produce it and the type of oil we make is cheaper for them to use and refine. Is that impressive? This is impressive, right? Again, think of the implications to our economy in the long run. And then I'll end it this with this oh, the oil thing. What do you call a group that controls the price, tells you when you can buy, who you can sell to, and how much you can sell? What is that called in the United States? Mob. mob. That's called a mob. You know, in the oil world, we have a very nice name for them. It's called OPEC. Same thing, different title. Yeah. And what do you think OPEC feels about the energy independence from United States? Don't like it, right? So expect disruption in this area. They're not going to give up their control easily. People go, why don't we just start and set the price? We can't. 
If it's going to be an uphill battle, are they going to give up control that easily? No. no. But is it going to be an area for disruption? Sure is. And that's what we like in the economy. Let's bring it back to all of us. And what does this mean for our investments? Right? We've had, again, the longest running bull market. 3,453 days without a significant pullback. And I define significant as a drop of 20% from any high that we set. The last time was March 2009. And since then, we have been on a tear up. Long time? Feels good? Who's scared? OK, so what does this mean and how should we invest? One of the things that we look for, this is your echocardiogram. So if you were to go to the hospital when you don't feel so good, that line in the middle that you see, that would be when all of you panicked back in 2008. What are we looking at here? This is the market's volatility. So every time the market drops, each of you panic, call Chris and say, get me out, that line pops up. Right? So it moves in the opposite direction and stock markets go high, everyone feels great, and that line comes down. In 2017, we entered an extremely anomalous year. What do I mean by that? No volatility, right? The long-term average, which is that red dotted line, is at 20, and last year we headed into 10. Is that normal? No, no, no. I say this. When my hairstylist starts to give me a stock tip, I don't like it. <laughs> and I say it in seriousness. It builds exuberance. So what we saw was 2017 was a very anomalous year. Historically, the stock market has corrections, and we define a correction as a 10% drop from the high. Whatever high it's set, if it drops 10% from there, that is a correction in the marketplace. Corrections are very normal. They happen at least one to two times a year, and it still ends up on the top. So we came out of 2017 where the biggest drop we saw was 3%. Normal? Far from it. So next time we see this, so when you saw what you experienced in February, it felt worse than normal because we came out of such a calm market. When you go from there to experiencing what happened in February, feels a little jittery. But the next time you see a correction, what are you going to tell Chris and team? Chris, corrections are normal. <laughs> Don't bother me with this. That's what we're seeing here. Again, a very anomalous time period. So, be aware of disconnecting the emotions that markets don't operate on a calendar or monthly cycles. They don't go up month by month. If we did, we would never make the money that we do in the markets. But the other portion is correlation. And this one looks at how stocks and bonds behave together. Every time the market gets nervous, the line that you see when it goes up means everything starts to move together. You want to sell everything. That makes sense? So you get nervous and you don't want to hold on to anything. I want to hold on to cash. So everything starts to fall. What we see here is that the line and the correlations are lower, but here's the part. How many of you have seen the stock market returns? Feels great returns this year, right? The S&P 500 is up a little over 8.5%. I'm rounding. How many of you would be surprised if I told you that 95% of those returns came from six stocks? So you should be like, well, I hope you picked me the six stocks, right? <laughs> the point here is that when you have concentrated pockets of return, this is when you have to be ever more cognizant of not chasing the six, right? This is when you want to spread out how you invest, such that you have a chance of having a few of these. But to pick winners every single year is nearly impossible to do. So when you look at your statements and you go, well, how come I'm not expecting what's happening there? It's because of where the returns have come from, and they truly have been concentrated to the Amazons. 
the Facebooks, the Apples of the world, right? Which is a very small portion of the markets. You cannot expect your portfolio to behave that way. So be aware of when you look at markets like this, you're going to start to see some of these anomalies show up. Do not break your discipline. Right? This is when we want all of you to be disciplined. Let's look further though, but something else that is going to change and is going to have a meaningful impact is what happens to interest rates. How many of you think interest rates are going to zero? Not hard to do from here, right? So when interest rates go up, it does have an impact on your bond portfolios and it's the opposite of what you may think. Typically you think, if interest rates are going up, I should make more money. Well, you do if you're buying new bonds, but if you have bonds in your portfolio, it's not so good for you. What I mean by that is, if I'm a bond, can I pick on you, sir, since you've been so brave sitting up front? I'm bond A, you're bond B. Your bond offers 7% in return, and my bond offers 4 Making example here, which bond would you want to buy? So as a result, as interest rates go up, your old bonds start to look less attractive. So they start to pay less for my bonds. So you want to think about that in terms, and I know that Chris's team has already started to look at these strategies and how to change direction in this new environment that we're in. So that the last thing is that the world is not just made up of the United States, okay? I know we're very myopic and we spend quite a bit of time here and we are a significant portion, but we are not the entire portion. Look at this chart on the left hand side. That pie shows how the US, the, the global equity markets are made up. And what percent is the United States of the global stock markets? About half, right? So when you look at leaving everything else on the table, you are leaving opportunities abroad, nearly half the opportunities on the table. I'm going to fast forward to my favorite section. Let's talk about entrepreneurship and innovation. How many of you feel that the US is competitive as an entrepreneur today? A couple of, all right, I'm glad. This is where I often don't get a lot of hands. Look at the room, right? There were a few went and they said, no, we don't feel we're competitive enough anymore. I'm going to use one company that I've already mentioned as a, just a way to set the stage. Apple again, let's just talk about Apple. Recently crossed over $1 trillion in its size. Is that big? All right, well now this is what's going to make, bring it home. There's only 16 countries in the world with economies bigger than Apple. Let me say it again. There's only 16 countries in the world with economies greater than that of Apple, one company. Is that surprising? Yeah. It is nearly 60% of Canada's economy. How many of you are surprised by that? That's one example. How many of you have heard of the medical innovations that we're seeing here? Medical innovations are significant. In fact, one half of all new drugs developed in the world comes from the United States, despite the heavy regulations that we have here. One half of all new drugs developed and available to all of us developed right here in the United States. Is that important? Why is this important? Why do I emphasize this? I emphasize this because without entrepreneurship and innovation, do we move forward as an economy? Do we stay competitive? This is what is the showstopper, so to speak. I use two simple examples, but many such examples exist throughout the economy, across multiple sectors, and when we look at this, truly, I think we're very, very blessed in what we have. I'm going to end with this one example here. How many of you look at who wins the Nobel Prize? I'm totally a geek. 
I've watched this all the time. How many of you would marvel if I were to tell you that the Nobel Prize won in robotics and physics area were by two physicists, one from here and one from another country, that developed this microscopic robot that can go into your veins and kill individual cancer cells such that you don't have to take radiation into your body. Would that be life changing? That is life changing and these are the things that continue to be developed right here in the United States. Again, we don't get to talk about these things because we're inundated with things at the bottom of the screen called breaking news. Anyone ever wonder, ever see any good breaking news? It's always bad. So, but I can't end here without talking about risks. And we did this at the start of the year and there are some new risks that have come up since then. North Korea has been a risk for as far as I can remember in my lifetime and through many of your lifetimes. And the way we see it in North Korea and how we live and adjust portfolios for this is that we don't build for the bunker. We don't. If we built for the bunker, none of us would make any money. So we hope that that is a situation that we, for the sake of humanity, never have to address. But the Fed, we watch very, very closely. We don't think we have an issue just yet. Euphoria and greed, we don't think that's the case just yet because right after 2017, we went back to normal. But what was the question I asked you and all of you nodded? Do you remember 2008? And you all went like this. And why is that important? Because despite the returns that we have seen in the stock markets, many of us perhaps never experienced it because we sat waiting for confirmation after what happened in 2008, right? So we've never seen the greed come back into the marketplace because it was very near and dear in terms of what happened in 2008. And the last one is the rise in equity market volatility. More importantly, how stock market returns behave. Don't just look at the singular return. There's going to be news underneath it that you have to parse through. So don't just say, I want this return. Maintain the discipline as it relates to what happens in your portfolio. With that, I get to finally shut up. So lucky all of you, I just want to say a big thank you for Chris and team for having me join all of you. And again, for all of you being such great participants today. Am I staying on for questions now? Uh, or later? Stay up there. Okay. Yep. We have another round of applause for Kezia. She does a great job. That is some uh, extremely complex information out there that I think you did a wonderful job of relaying in a way that most of us can understand, so thank you uh, very much. Uh, my name is Corey Sundstrom. For those of you that don't know me, I'm the Director of Financial Planning here. I hope this has been extremely helpful for you to hear, just to get an update and a health check on the market and the economy and how things are going. Uh, we always like to take this and invite you to come into the office uh, so that we can go through your situation, relate this back to how your finances are and how your portfolio is doing. Um, so please feel free to reach out to us. If this sparks any questions whatsoever, uh, we'd be happy to go over those. Uh, we are going to take a few minutes. Uh, Chris, if you'd like to come up here as well. Uh, we are going to field a couple of questions from you guys. We have about 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes or so to do that. So for those of you on this side, I think Mike has a microphone. Uh, that he can walk down. Uh, so if we want to take uh, one of these gentlemen here and then we'll kind of go around the room with questions. I'd like to hear your, your uh, perspective on the short-term and long-term yield curves. I've been reading a lot about those and how does that fit in with what you've discussed here? Okay, so the question that came was about how the interest rate curve, meaning if you look at interest rates across different maturities, right? Typically, shorter term, you should get less money. Long term, you should get more money. What's happening in that space? So we look for something called the flattening of the yield curve, and more importantly, the inversion of a yield curve. Complex term, so bear with me as I go through this. 
The flattening of the yield curve means that the Fed has been raising interest rates in the short term. Yeah, this is one side of the arm. On the other hand, you've got the 10-year or the 20-year or the 30-year bonds not moving that much. So what happens when the short term starts to tick up and the long term starts to stay flat? You start to get a flat interest rate or flat yield curve. That is not always a great thing. Okay? And the reason it's not a great thing, because why? How do we grow our economy? Spending money. What happens when interest rates start to go up? You stop, this, you stop spending money. I can invest and save on the long side. So it creates a psychology of potentially slowing the economy down. But there are some very interesting factors that we watch for. This we think is a very anomalous time in the marketplace based on what the Fed did and the amount of monies that it has spent. When we start to see it flatten too far, currently we have about a 50 basis points or 0.5% gap between the short term and what's happening on the long term or the 10 year portion of the bonds. That's not so worrisome. When it starts to cross over, it is worrisome and we're far from it. Here's why I don't worry about it too much and here's why it's happening today. So the Fed is raising interest rates. It's absolutely the case. What's happening to all other central banks? They're not really raising interest rates. But in addition, what bond would you rather buy? And this is why it's happening. The 10-year bond currently pays you 2. I don't know, 75%. Okay? The 10-year German government bond. Same quality, different country. Anyone know how much that pays you for 10 years? 0.35%. What would you rather buy? <laughs> Hide it in the mattress, he said. You're going to buy the US government bond. Does that make sense? So instead of monies going abroad, they're all coming and buying long-term bonds. And so when there's a lot of buyers on the long-term bond, what happens to the, the prices go up? interest rates go down. We think this is artificially induced based on what's happened in the macro environment. So not to be compared one for one relative to past economic cycles. Very different in that terms. When it turns upside down, meaning the short term interest rates pay you more than long term bonds, then we have trouble. That is a classic signal of recessionary time periods. That is when you don't spend any money, right? You just put it in the six, term, six month CD. That is far from the case. We don't see that any term in the near or the intermediate cycle, but we watch for that. But place context in how we got here and why those factors are shaping the economy. Did I address your question? All right, any other questions? Uh, yeah, right here. Would you talk for a few moments on what, if, what effect the tariffs might have yeah. on the economy? Sure. Question was on tariffs. I'm going to be two-sided. I like to look at both sides of the equation. Right? So let's talk about why tariffs and where is this conversation even stemming from. It's kind of just popped out. By the way, we've been, all countries engage in some form of tariffs all the time. It's the escalation that is new. Why tariffs and why these potential trade wars? The primary driver is with China, and China has been doing something in the, it's well known, but you can't pinpoint them because you've got to play nice in the sandbox, is that they have been stealing intellectual property. What do I mean by that? Remember the entrepreneurship and innovation that I talked about? How long do you think it takes to build that new pill? Long time. How long does it take to build a technology? Long time. So what China did was, well, if you want to enter our markets, you can come into our markets, but you have to tell us how you build it. And lo and behold, about six months or a year or two years down the road, there's a new version of it that looks and does the same thing, but it's called slightly different. Is that hurtful to our economy? So when we did a study, the approximate impact of tariffs is somewhere in the 600 to 700 billion annually. Because these have long-term ramifications for it. So that's the why start this war. 
Let's talk about the other side, though. The, the reason why potentially tariffs are not the most optimal tool to execute is that you just don't know what the other side's going to do. And what markets hate the most is uncertainty. When it cannot predict how you're going to react or how China is going to react, it creates uncertainty in the marketplace. However, are we the largest consumer? We sure are. If you're a Walmart, do you get pricing power? Yes. So we have the ability to potentially negotiate better trade deals, but how we're doing it and the execution may not match, right? But the logic is there, and as we get to doing the trade deals with Mexico and or potentially Canada, you'll notice we start to unroll this. But until this is sorted out, it will be noise in the marketplace. This is the last point I'll make on tariffs. The impact on what has been announced to date. Okay, you have to look at what's been announced and what's policy. There's a lot of rhetoric, meaning there's a lot of chatter, but none of it is policy. So you may see a brand new headline, breaking news, going at the bottom of the ticker tape, that has nothing to do with actual effective policy. Right? The effective policy today, based on what has been announced and what is in place for the tariffs, impacts 0.04% of our economy. So minuscule today, but can it ratchet up? Yes, and that's what we're watching very closely. It's very hard to predict that, but that's two sides of the argument on why it's taking place. There's a one more minute. Uh, are the protections placed after the 08 crash into the market area up in New York and everywhere else, do you think that's effective and you f are you seeing them trying to get around the back of those? So your question is very broad based. The, the question was the protections that have been placed post the credit crisis, is it effective? Okay, so I'm gonna address it from, do you mean by the markets? Or just in general and how we, the economy got there? Yes. Yes. So the, the biggest driver of what got us there was it, anyone here of the I don't have a job, I don't have any money, I can get a mortgage? <laughs> Does that sound like trouble? <laughs> that doesn't sound so good. So the first time, right, post, post that time period, new rules and regulations have been put in place such that <coughs> banks can't just sell off this bad debt, right? So they have to hang on to some of it. And what we have seen is that the average credit score of even though the debt amount has increased, the average credit score of who is taking it out is above 760. So for anyone who watches your credit score closely, 760 is a very, very high credit score to attain, which means that people who can afford things are now buying it rather than it being broad based. That to me was one of the fundamental things that shifted us from 2007 into the world mess that we got in. So I see that as one indicator. Similar things have been put in place. Other things have been lax, but in general, the greed and the euphoria that built up 2007, we're not seeing that same bubble, right? We're always looking for what's the next bubble. We're not seeing that same effect just yet. All right, we've got time for one more question. Do anybody have another? Bill. Oh. Oh. Got a question about the deficit. You hear some economists say it matters, some say it doesn't. So what's your view on how the size or amount of the deficit yeah. impacts what you've talked about today? The size that the, the actual, I always say this, the size of the debt itself is not the number that we're looking for. At some point, it'll matter, but it's our ability to service the debt. When you are a borrower, let's just use one of us as an example. When you're a borrower and you've gone out, what's the first thing they want to see? Can you pay your debt down? Right? That's something that we watch for. 
And as the U.S. economy, we watch for that very closely as well. The ability to service the debt in the near to intermediate term is very strong based on what our economy does and our competitive nature relative to how the other global economies are as well. Longer term, though, we do have to address this. This is not something we can escape, right? And the implications of that are on the longer end of the trail, but however, today we have the benefit of being the literally the best economy against the bunch. So I look at this in short <coughs> terms. There's no way to say that deficits don't matter. Shorter term, the ability to service is very, very strong, which is why our credit quality relative to others in the economies are very strong, which is why jobs continue to grow here. But the longer term, I don't have the full answer to it, and I'm not seeing any current scope in how best to answer it being laid out there either. So a problem in the long run. No, not even in the intermediate term. Because again, we stack us where we are, look at where Germany is. We're still better than even the best country in Europe, right? Yeah. I think I've run out of time. Yep. Again, a uh, round of applause for uh, Kezia, please. <laughs> Phenomenal job. Thank you so much.